Well, it's a great joy for me to welcome Nayaswami Shivani today with us. And uh, Shivani was a founding member of Ananda Village in California, as well as Ananda in Europe. And she's been a dear friend to both Daya and to me all of the years that we've been involved with Ananda. Just yesterday, Shivani arrived from her home at uh, Ananda, Italy. And she'll share with us now, as well as at her workshop following the satsang here, that you're all welcome to join. Shivani. It really is a pleasure and very unusual for me to be away from my home base at this time of year. It's an unusual year, and I'm very happy to spend this period of time with you. You know, the final days of a year are very important, just like the final moments of a life, and just like every meditation, because it gives us the opportunity to look at life and look at ourselves and to evaluate where we are and how we're doing and how things have been going and what God has been saying to us during this time. <clears throat> There's, they say in the scriptures that it takes a whole lot of incarnations for the soul to remember what and who it really is. The scriptures say that just to come up to a human level <clears throat> takes five to eight million incarnations. That's really frightening, is it? It's not, it's not one of the happier statistics on the spiritual path. Very few of the statistics are really very happy. But I tend to be an optimist, and I believe that all of you are optimists as well. Because I've always thought that it really takes only one incarnation to find God. But one incarnation where we live every single moment completely. Because every moment of our lives, God is calling to us. God is talking to us. God is guiding us. God is showing us the way. But you know, we tend to be on another phone call at the time when he's calling. As we know, our master said, and I believe it was Lahiri Mahashaya, the minutes, the minutes are more important than the years. The universe communicates. It's just constantly, constantly communicating. This universe is made up of vibration, of sound, of words, and of God's grace. Master said that every atom is endowed with individuality and with consciousness. And consciousness is communicating to us. It's really showing us the way. We just celebrated Christmas, and I believe you had wonderful experiences here. And it's the welcoming of Christ consciousness into our own consciousness and into our lives. What is Christ consciousness? You know, Master says it's that still point at the heart of every atom. If we could just get deeply, deeply into the atom, into the still point. I remember once when we went to Disneyland with Swami. Yes, Swami loved Disneyland, by the way. And his favorite uh, attraction there was this ride where you got in a car and it took you into the heart of the atom. He just loved that. You know, just going through the inner space, you know, and the light and the awareness and the consciousness. And this is, of course, what we hope to be doing in every one of our meditations, is just getting into the still moment, that still 
between every two movements, there's stillness. That's why we practice the Hong Sa technique. Not just for the Hong and the Sa, but for what's between the Hong and the Sa, and the Sa and the Hong. That silence, that deep, deep silence, it's the, it's the sounds or songs of silence that speak to us and that guide our lives. <clears throat> there was many years ago now, many years ago, a study that was done at a university by a candidate for his doctorate degree. And this study has become very famous and has been replicated and it's very well known all over the world. And the psychologist who did get his doctorate degree, his name is Dr. Raymond Moody, and he published his findings in a book called Life After Life. And perhaps you've heard of that and have heard of his experiments. And his research was with people who were in the emergency room and who had experienced momentarily or for a longer period of time clinical death. And then they came back. They were either revived or they spontaneously <clears throat> came back. And he went to these people and asked them if they remembered anything during the period when they were not alive. <clears throat> And many of them did have memories. And what their memories were are included in this book. And a very uh, brief documentary film was made of it called Life After Life. And I'm not going to tell you all about it, except for their initial experience of being dead. And uh, this is something that we can take heart from. Um, we're often told, I don't know if you're told, that we don't know what death is like because nobody ever died and came back to tell about it. Now, did your parents tell you that? Yeah. Well, that's not true anymore because of Dr. Raymond Moody's study. Because many people have died and they have come back and they have told about it. And what they tell is this story. They say that they recognize that they're no longer in control of their physical body because they are aware, they try to speak, they try to move their body, and it's just not working. But they're seeing themselves from outside of themselves. And they talk about being up in the corner of a room or of a situation and looking down on it. And they're completely aware. They're aware of what the doctors say and the nurses are saying. And the doctors and nurses are saying it's no hope, they're gone, they're dead. And uh, this person is trying to communicate, saying, no, no, I'm not dead. I'm here. You know, can't you see me? Can't you hear me? And then when they realize that there's no communication channel open, what almost all of them tell about is this passage through a tunnel and that they're moving at quite a fast speed and some of them talk about a wind uh, that's propelling them onward. <clears throat> and at the end of the tunnel, they're seeing a light, not a light, they're seeing light. And so as they travel through the tunnel, they come closer and closer to light until finally they emerge into a world of light. <clears throat> now what's interesting is that almost all of them say that there is somebody there that meets them. <clears throat> and for each individual, that somebody is different. For some of them, it's like their grandmother or a teacher, or their guru, or Buddha, or Jesus, or Krishna, or an angel, you know, that they don't recognize except that they're a being of light. And in that moment, every one of them says that they feel completely loved and accepted, so much so, so much joy, 
that they all have the same thought. This is where I belong, and I never want to go back. I want to stay here. And so the <clears throat> being who meets them says, you will have that choice, but first, I want to show you your life. And so the angel, I have this little fantasy in my mind, takes them to the cosmic uh, cinema, and they sit down, <clears throat> and they see their life. It just like we've always heard, right? When right before you die, your whole life passes uh, before your eyes. And so they become aware of everything they've done and not done, and how what they have done and not done has affected other people and affected themselves. And so this being of light says to them, uh, you're watching this show, and I want you to see how much you've learned in this life, and how much have you loved. <coughs> and so the person looks at their life, and at the end of the show, they say to the angel, I haven't learned enough, and I haven't loved enough. And so the angel says, well, you can stay if you want to, or you can go back, and you can learn, and you can love. Because they saw how many lessons there were that they missed, totally missed, because they were on another phone call. And they saw how many opportunities there were to love, but they weren't expecting love to come through certain channels. So the people who come back are obviously the ones who made that choice. And we don't know how many others made the other choice and just stayed there. I'd like to read you something that uh, I've put in the workbook that we're using this afternoon when we look at at least one year of our life you know, a whole life is too much to do, and we need to get practice. So we're going to practice doing it in our seminar just one year. <clears throat> and in our workbook, um, there's this excerpt from an article that Master wrote. And I'm just going to read you a little bit. He says, We should be instructed by this cosmic motion picture of life. It is not being shown without a reason. Each day we behold different scenes, and each day has a lesson to teach. You are meant to learn the lesson by concentrating on the supreme purpose of human existence, to know who is behind your life. So this is what we're going to be doing today. We learn lessons because that's what life's purpose is. As Master said, the purpose of life, who wants to finish that sentence, is to educate us and entertain, entertain us. Okay, so it's not always entertaining, but it's always educational. And the more we get the education, the more entertaining it becomes. But you know, when we're aware we learn things also that happen to other people. You know, it's not that we need to suffer. Okay. There was a chant that I heard Swami sing when, when I, was, I first came to Ananda. That was almost before there was an Ananda. Never liked the chant. Never sang it. It starts out, in the valley of sorrow. You know that chant? In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years, oh God, my God, or till tomorrow. So, now that's the part I like. You know, it's not the thousand years of suffering in the valley of sorrow, but that we have the choice that we can wake up in one day. I'll tell you just a very little thing I, I learned this year. <clears throat> it was, it's something that happened to a friend of mine. And uh, she was, 
walking you know, on, on the street right near our center, and she fell and broke her nose. And she did very well with it. You know, she went and had something put on, and she looked kind of funny for a while, and she sang in the choir, and people would smile and so forth. And at some point I had a chance to ask her, how did you fall? You know, I mean, she fell face down on the asphalt road, just... And she said, I was looking at my telephone, and I tripped. And I had my telephone in my hand, and I didn't brace myself. So I commiserated with her, and I connected that. And, you know, learning lessons in life is a lot about connecting dots. I connected that with another very small episode, a conversation I had with Swami. And this was one year when I came back from India, and as you know, I come here every year. And I went to see Swami to greet him and say, I'm, I'm back, I'm happy to be back. And he said, how was your experience? Tell me something about it. <clears throat> So I told him that we went to visit, we were in Rishikesh, and we went to the Swami Shivananda ashram. And we met with the, the head of the ashram, and that I was impressed that he, like Swami Shivananda, was able to do many things at the same time. Shivananda was a very uh, well-known multitasker. So much so that many of his books, if not all of them, were written by inviting disciples to come in and they would write what he said and he would dictate to them different books. So he'd dictate to one one book and while that disciple was writing, then he'd do another one and another one and another one. I was always very impressed with that because uh, I love multitasking. So I told Swami about how impressed I was with that, because the head was, he was signing letters, and he was talking to somebody and answering a question, and he was speaking to us. And Swami said, I don't think this is a good thing. He said, that's not our teaching. He said, Master taught us that we should do one thing at a time, do it well. Do it deeply, do it completely. Give our full attention to what it is that we're doing, our full concentration. And I realized that Swami doesn't, never was a multitasker. He, when he was writing, he was writing, and then he finished, and then he would be with people, and then he would finish, and then he would. And that impressed me. And from that time, I started to decrease my multitasking, and now I'm not. I'm a one-tasker one person. But when my friend fell, I realized that she was doing two things at the same time, and that I also, like so many of us, you know, walk and look at the phone and do whatever. And I just said, Swami saying, Shivani, you know, you haven't learned that lesson completely. You know, look at your friend. And so I never, when I walk, phone is in the pocket. I never take it out, you know. And when I'm walking down the stairs, I'm only walking down the stairs. And just, and so this is something, you know, that didn't happen to me. I didn't have to do the, you know, thousand years of suffering in the valley of sorrow. I mean, perhaps I have in the past. And it just took that one little thing. So when we're living our lives, you know, minute by minute, there's so much we can learn, so much that happens to us, that happens to our friends, and we can grow so much. <clears throat> I'd like to tell you, finish with this story, yeah, something I learned from Swamiji. And I don't know if I've told you this story before. It's one of my favorite experiences with Swami. It was in the early 70s, and there was the, Swami was living at the meditation retreat, so it was quite early on. It must have been 1972. doesn't matter. But he was in seclusion in his dome 
there. And he was in seclusion for one month or more. And I was working at the retreat at that time at, in the reception. I was greeting people and registering them and so forth. And I had the job every day that when the mail came, that was before internet, can you believe there was a time before internet? Some of you don't even remember. You, you've never lived in a time before internet. And the uh, post came, not by email, but by snail mail. So the post came every day to the meditation retreat, and it was my job around 3 o'clock to take Swami's letters go to his house and leave it in a basket by his door and go away. And so I always did that and I was, you know, I tried to be totally, you know, invisible, you know, like have zero vibration. <laughs> you know, no no thought in my mind, no question in my mind, just totally, you know, like to slip through the atoms, you know, of the universe and just go and put it down and come back. So one day, this woman arrives in the reception area, and she looked really unusual. You know, her hair was, I don't remember, green or yellow or whatever, and she had these colorful clothes. And in, in my memory, I'm sure she didn't, but she was carrying a magic wand, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I said hello, and I asked her her name, and her name was something, you know, strange, like, you know, Sky Mountain or something like that. And so I said, are, are you here to stay with us? She said, yeah, a while. So I'm writing down her, you know, information. I read you, her name is Sky Mountain and everything. And so <clears throat> I said, well, what's your address? And she said, I come from Venus. <laughs> and I, I said to her, because in America, there's cities of every name. I mean, every name. You know, there's Florence, America, Rome, America, Milan, America. There's everything you can find. And so I said to her, what state is it in? <laughs> you know, Venus, what state is it in? Connecticut or, you know, New York. And, you know, she looks at me, you know. She says, it's in the solar system. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, I, Venus, of course, so I write down Venus. And, you know, I'm just trying to stay in, in my spine, you know, not laugh, not, you know, not, <clears throat> no judgment. Okay, she came from Venus. So I said, well, fine, you know, uh, why are you here? What would you like to do? And she said, I have a message from Yogananda for Swami. So at this point, I bite my tongue. I'm not going to laugh, you know, and I, in, in, inside of me, I go, yeah, really. <clears throat> and uh, because, you know, Master said he would never come to us through anybody. And if Master has a message for us, he'll tell us, you know, through ourselves or through a book or something. You know, but nothing? I say nothing. But what I say is, oh, I'm so Swami, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Swami is in seclusion, he's in silence. Perhaps you could write it down, and when I go today, I'll take the letter to him. And perhaps, you know, he'll answer you if you stay a few days. And she says, no, 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 Yogananda says I have to give it to him in person. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, he really, he's in seclusion and he's in silence. She said, well, I'll wait. So, okay, so... I made her comfortable and so forth. So that day, three o'clock, the letters come. I go down to, to Swami, you know, invisible. And as I get there, Swami is on the porch. And he's smiling and he takes the mail and he looks through it. And he, sa he says to me, he says, is there anything else, Shivani? No, Swami? I said, no, all the mail is here. And he looks again and he says, is there anything else? No more letters, I say, Swami. <laughs> There's nothing else. And then he looks at me with a penetrating look, look and he said, is there nothing else, Shivani? I said, well, Swami, there's a woman here. She says she comes from Venus and she says she has a message for you from Yogananda. And I kind of snicker a little, like, ha, ha, ha. And Swami looks for a moment, you know, just for that moment, like, you know, off into the distance, and then he says to me, 
I will see the woman from Venus. I'm shocked, <clears throat> totally shocked. He's in seclusion, he's in silence, master's not gonna you know, come to her. All of these rational reasons. So at th at, he says, bring her down at four o'clock. So I show her down at four o'clock. I don't know what happens. She go and she leaves. That's the end of it for, I think, a few months. So later on, sometime I'm sitting next to Swami at a meal, and I remember the situation. And I say, Swami, do you remember the lady from Venus? And he said, oh, yes. yes. So I said to him, did she really have a message for you from Yogananda? You know, and I was expecting him to say something light and we would laugh about it or, you know, he would say again, Master said he, none of that. <clears throat> what he said to me was, I doubt the message was from Yogananda. However, she had something very important to say to me and I was appreciative. I was shocked. I was just shocked. I mean, just his openness, you know. And this is the openness that we want to have. 